to this, your worst nightmare. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of the Ripper Radio Podcast. This is your Friday night spotlight edition with Enemy. Those guys will be coming up at the bottom of the hour. We got a lot of bands in store for you. So let's don't waste any time. For the very first time on the Ripper Radio Podcast, this is Death Metal Pope. And this is the title track for their new album, and this is called Harvest. And it's coming at you right now. Oh, 
you know, if you live in a world where fifty three billion animals are being killed every year and the best justification we have is they taste good, it's not surprising that we have an awful lot of violence in the world and that people have become inured to it because it's part of our lives.
essere celesti eleva te lo spirito nuovo cosmo di mercurio e sangue. Grazia di luce, isola in oceano di pace.
All right, that was Euphoria with Hater. Before that, we had Soundstorm with the Dragonfly. Zephra with Gone by Dawn. Moscow's own slot with six more steps. Vent C with Ascend. Mind Wars with No Voice. And we started that program off with Death Metal Pope with their song Harvest. We're just seconds away from our Friday night spotlight with Enemy. And we'll be right there with Gray here in just a second. Hey guys, my name is Frank X, and you're listening to the Friday Night Spotlight Show. It's time for the Friday Night Spotlight on Ripper Radio. The following program is closed captioned for the thinking impaired. It's time, it's time, it's time, it's time for the Friday Night Spotlight, and this week's Friday Night Spotlight is Enemy. We have Gray from the band Enemy joining us live on the air. Say hello to the peoples. How we all doing out there, folks? This is Gray here from Enemy, and uh, it's really nice to be with you all this evening. Shout out to Rick guys at Ripper Radio for making this possible. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, probably start off with a brief history of the band and maybe some of your own history in previous bands. Um, how did uh, Enemy get its start? Uh, that's actually, uh, it's, uh, it's a good question. Um, it, it came about through, um, me and Steph, the guitar player, just, uh, actually bouncing around on these classified ads looking for musicians. And I think that both of us had, uh, well, Steph had taken a break from music for a while and I was kind of halfway out of a project that I was working on previously and I, I was pretty much almost done. I was getting ready to throw in the musical towel. I'm not saying that I would never play anything again, but uh, I had just been so much time working on a project and it wasn't panning out. And uh, I started talking to him and uh, he said, I'd, I'd really like to try this with you if you're interested. And I said, OK, well, you know, send me a, send me a couple of tracks or something. Let, let me hear what it sounds like. So the first thing he sent me was actually the uh, track for Demon Inside, which is the the title track of the album. And uh, I heard it and pretty much liked it right away. I said, yeah, I think I could definitely do something with this. I said, tell you what, I said, uh, give me 24 hours and I'm going to write lyrics and melodies. I'm going to record it. I have a home studio and I'll send you back a demo version tomorrow. And he told me after the fact that when I told him that, he uh, actually just kind of started laughing at me. And he said, like, yeah, yeah, okay, 24 hours, you're going to get it back to me. I've heard that before. And sure enough, I got out the old pen and paper and started humming along to it. And 24 hours later, I sent him the track. He loved it and said, I really want to do this. I'll send you some more material. And uh, that's how the whole thing started. Um. Over the next uh, about six weeks, we actually wrote the tracks for the whole album. Everything was pretty much done in about six weeks' time. It was a really quick writing process. It was very easy. He basically sent me music but told me I could arrange the parts the way I wanted, uh, to put them more from a a lyricist, vocalist standpoint, to make sure that it all fit together well if there was something that wasn't exactly the way I needed it to be to sing over. Some of it I did switch a little bit. Some of it the way he sent to me was perfect the way it was. And, uh, yeah, six weeks later, the album was pretty much written and done in a demo form. Uh, the hard part came after that when we said, okay, well, you know, we've got this album now. We've got to get players and guys that can play to this level and, you know, are going to want to do it with a smile on their face. And there's always that issue of compatibility because, I mean, or knows anything about music knows that you can – pretty much write music with anything, but to actually make it stick together and hold and feel like a band, there's got to be somewhat of a, I don't know, a brotherhood there, I guess you could call it, like a camaraderie amongst the guys. I've had bands where that hasn't happened. This one, the guys all like each other, but it took us a long time to find the guys. I think Steph probably went through three, four, five bases before he found Rob, uh, that was a really nice fit. Rob is like the, I don't know, the typical best friend kind of guy. You know, he's always got a smile on his face, always wants to play, very enthusiastic about everything, good bass player, solid. And that kind of worked out. Uh, 
pretty much from as soon as he met Rob, he's like, yeah, I think this guy's going to be the one. And sure enough, like after a couple of uh, times them getting together, it panned out perfectly. The went through a few drummers to find Eric. And I mean, Steph was the guy that the guitar player that was really doing all the legwork behind the project in a sense that I, I had just came out of looking for band members and f- ending up having a blowout with my band. And I said, look, I said, I'm in, but you're going to have to find these guys. I can't do this again and just like spend years of time searching. And he had the patience, the drive. He put it all all together and he really just found the guys to make it work. It took him about a year and a half. Finally, uh, I guess after a year of searching, like he got Rob first and then Eric came in, our drummer later. And Eric is fantastic. Eric is the drummer that I've been wanting to find and wanting to play with for the past, I don't know, 20 plus years. Great attitude, easy to get along with. He's a rock solid drummer, bang on, tight. You couldn't ask for a better guy, easy to work with, uh, fit right into that brotherhood kind of thing that I was talking about. It was literally, I got a call from Stefan saying, this is the guy will be complete. This is the guy. He said, you got to come in next week and jam with us. They did one jam without me just to bang out the music. I went in the next week, sang the songs with the band. We went from the album start to finish on our second jam. And that was it. It was a done deal. He said, okay, let's start recording this thing. And they went into the studio a couple weeks later and started laying down the drum tracks. And that's pretty much where it ended up. It's uh, It was a long two-year journey. After six weeks of getting it all written, it took another year and whatever, 10 months to actually put the rest of it together. But here we are. The album's done. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, so what would you get? Would you consider your major influences on your writing style or vocal style? Well, uh, that's that, that, that's actually, if you're asking me personally, I come from uh, uh, back in the day, because I was a guitar player before I was a singer. I actually played guitar in a band for years and switched over to singing because I couldn't find a singer. So my earliest influences, mind you, I guess you would call them vocal influences, being a singer as well. I was hugely into stuff like uh, Queensryche back in the day. Operation Mindcrime is my favorite album of all time. I liked a lot of the prog stuff back in that era too, the Dream Theater type stuff. Um, and then I went into the heavier phase where I got into the stuff that was more like Pantera and that type of music. Um, and then it just, I guess it sort of evolved from there where I got into like the skid rows and those type of things. And I always was very much liking, um, certain singers. I always went for the, the singers that were a little over the top, whether it be, they could, you know, like sing higher or they had a lot of power and never actually myself um, contemplating myself ever actually being a singer. I was always the guitar player and just kind of loved these vocal styles. And um, once I started actually singing, uh, I, I kind of started at that point in my just listening career, um, I started getting to some heavier type vocals where I started listening to stuff like um, In Flames, Kill Switch Engage, uh, really like a lot of stuff like that. So I try when I actually write my own stuff. I really do like the heavy approach to vocals, but I still like to keep it very clear where you can hear what the words are actually saying, because I put a lot of time and effort into lyrics to making sure that they're actually sung about a topic or a theme and not just gibberish. I know everybody probably says that, but um, if you read the enemy lyrics, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're a good read. I think that anybody could pick up the sheet and really kind of have a listen to it, or even if they didn't listen to it and just read the lyrics off a piece of paper, I think that they could take something from it. I think that I've I've done uh, a decent job in in finding a spot with this album, kind of states where the world is at globally, um, and that's really where I I am. That's where my headspace is at when I was writing it from a, a lyrical and vocal standpoint. Uh, Steph was the guy that wrote all the guitar parts and Steph is your typical thrash guy. He's all about the down picking, how fast, how heavy. 
He's very technical. He's very tight, very clean, takes pride in his down picking. And I know that, trust me, he's listening to this right now and he is laughing his ass off because I told him I was going to bring it up because we always have this conversation. I'm like, oh, Steph, you got to listen to that. It's good down picking. And he giggles every time. But, yeah, he's definitely a thrash guy all the way. Uh, He's into uh, the Slayers and Exodus and uh, some of the old uh, hardcore stuff, too. Even some of the really fast punk stuff from back in the uh, 80s, 90s. So he pretty much took all those things and uh, he combined that to make the writing style and threw that at me. And it was kind of funny because when I was talking about like the vocal styles he likes and he's talking about like, well, I'm into Slayer and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, but you went and listened to what I did and you know that I really don't sing that way, right? And he's like, no, no, I know you don't, but I think this will be good because the music has got my old school touch to it. But maybe if you put a little bit more of that modern twist on the vocals, maybe we can find a way to take that good old school thrash type sound and – and put a little bit of a modern twist to the vocals on it, so it's it, it's it's good to the people that really like the old Metallica and Megadeth and Slayer, you know, the big four type stuff. But maybe we can attract some of that like more modern, uh, call it Slipknot or any one of those more modern metal bands, if you will, and blend the two styles where we can maybe get some of the the audience that's the guys that are like you know the thirty five, forty, forty five, fifty that listened to the Metallica back in the day, as well as some of these 18, 19, 20 year old kids that are listening to stuff like Slipknot these days. So that was kind of the game plan when we, uh, we put all this thing together and recorded it. That was what we were kind of aiming for. Yeah. Speaking of the album, it's called demons inside. Um, Uh, just one. There's only one. Yeah. Sorry. (laughs) Demon, demon, demon. I have a habit of putting S's at things. Um, we're going to go ahead and play a song from that album. This is uh, Break the World. Would you like to tell me what that song is about, and then we'll play it? Um, yeah, Break the World is basically about a um, little bit of a touchy subject, but most of the uh, songs on the album are. Break the World is pretty much about war and terrorism and where, um, at what point does everybody kind of need to sit back and say this isn't good for anybody and and what will it take for us as a people to stop it i guess is the best way to put it um uh play your track and then if you want to i can go into the uh, the overview afterwards of how the whole demon inside concept came together all righty well this is is break the world from enemy coming at you right now
All right, that was Break the World from Enemy. And we're back on the air with Gray. So you like to um, tell everybody, like, this is a concept album. You like to go more depth on um, what exactly the Demon Inside album is about? Yeah, sure. Um, basically, I guess what it boils down to, the first track on the album is the Demon Inside track. And if you go to our webpage, there's actually like a paragraph, and it kind of it's just the overview of what the album is about. It basically it talks about the horrors of the world. Um, most of the album is pretty dark. There's topics of terrorism, war, um, pedophile, uh, religious uh, differences between people that cause fighting. Uh, there's something about September 11th in there. Columbine High School. There's something about that in there too. Um, and basically what it talks about is how each one of these things that as you, you're growing up or you see them or you witness it personally or one of these things actually happens to you as a person, it's how each one of these things takes a bite of your soul, eats away at you from the inside. And basically the concept is that if you witness enough of this stuff, once enough bites have been taken of your soul, the only thing left is the demon inside. And that's the overview of the album. That's the first song. About the next uh, nine songs after that, I believe, are each one are kind of a, a chapter, if you will, of something that is taking a bite away of our soul as people, as a as as a race. And it it just keeps going back to the fact that if if, if enough of this keeps happening, how do we survive? We become this demon inside. It it, it, it just overwhelms us. We become this. And then I I really don't like to leave. Um, things left to be totally grim and dark when I'm writing. I like. I'm not going to say that there's a perfect solution or there's always a, a Walt Disney ending, if you will. But I like to think there's like that light at the end of the tunnel. There's there's something that there's there's hope. There's something to look forward to. So the last two three songs on the album are basically um, about coming together, um, overthrowing this this these horrible things that happen. And just making the most of your life, uh, not waiting for these bad moments to happen, to go ahead and you can't go back. You can't relive your life. You've only got one shot to get it right. Go out there, put your best foot forward and, and, and try and make the best of it. Don't let this demon overtake you. You know, there's there's a way to battle through it. There's there's always a hope that there's something good at the end. Because, I mean, when you put on the news at 6 o'clock, I hate to tell you, but it needs to be renamed the bad news because there's not a lot of good. You get one little, you know, little league story about some kid hit a grand slam in baseball and then it goes downhill from there real quickly. And it just seems like the media loves to eat it up. Bad news sells, right? It's like a car wreck. You're driving down the highway. You see a bunch of cars piled up. There's bodies. There's blood. You're telling yourself, don't look at this. It's going to be bad. And what does everybody do? Everybody slows down and look. And that's exactly what the media loves to push onto people. Just is what it is. I don't think there's any way around it. It's just a matter of at certain points, close your eyes and pretend it's not there. They say sometimes ignorance is bliss. And I think if you can just shut that one part of your mind off and pretend that these things don't happen, I can't say pretend they don't happen. Know that it happens, but don't let it get to you, I guess is the best way that, to put it. And and don't let that 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 overtake you. Don't let the demon become you. Don't don't join that whole um that whole way of life. Just just step around it and and survive. That's the only way to be, and especially in today's world with the chaotic uh, situations going on in the United States, for sure. All kinds of yeah, well, people I'm, protesting everywhere. It's kind of crazy right now. Absolutely, um, it def definitely is. Now, speaking of the media and the news, um, they're full of lies. So let's go ahead and play the song "Lies." You like to speak a few words about that one before we play it? Lies. Uh, yeah, this is a really. Uh, touchy subject a little bit here for me. Um, Lies is a song that I wrote about a teacher that I had when I was in school. 
that uh, about 25 years later, we found out he was a pedophile. And um, he ended up, he's in jail now, years later. He was caught. He ended up in prison. And um, it was a guy that I, I knew. And I always thought he was a little weird, but I never knew he was weird to that extent. Uh, so I decided to put this song, I guess you could say, in his honor. Um and I could go a little deeper into that, but it does, uh, it does, it doesn't touch me personally, but I found out after the fact that, uh, somebody I knew was one of his, uh, victims, as we can say. So the song actually hits a little closer to home, and I didn't actually find out that somebody I knew was one of his victims until after I wrote it. So, uh, it's a little grim for me, but yeah, go ahead and play it. All right, here is Lies from Enemy. was lies by enemy and i was um kind of wondering so what's the like the can- canadian metal scene what's that like up there it's a little, every place i talk from different around, places around the world everybody has a different take on how their country's metal scene is and i was just kind of curious what do you what your take on the scene in your country is um i m- my problem with the montreal scene specifically right now if you're talking about montreal quebec not just canada is it seemed to me like there was a much bigger metal market back when I was like, let's say, in my late teens, early 20s. You could go out to a bar down in the main area of downtown Montreal, and you could literally pick and choose which band you were going to go see that night. There might have been like a big-name band in town, and there was probably about 5, 10, 15 other smaller local bands or semi-local bands that were playing at various clubs, and you could like just go anywhere and get a metal show on almost, I'm not going to say any night of the week, because Monday, Tuesdays or whatever, you know, and then there's never too much happening. But, like, I mean, anywhere, like, on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, even Sunday night, you could always find something. It seems like the scene around here lately, it, it, there's there's not as much metal. It seems like people are going out to, like, the, the dance clubs more. 
the clubs, there was a couple of clubs in Montreal that used to be like one, for example, it was called the brick and it was a massive, um, it was a massive metal bar. It was a bar, but it was a big bar. Um, I saw bands like, uh, Badlands in there. Alice in Chains played there. Lynch Mob played there. It was a, probably about 2000 that fit in there. Maybe not even quite that much, but the environment was fantastic. And just as one example, that place probably around the year 2000 turned into like a techno kind of bar. It's just that there's no more live music. It's a DJ scratching records and it's a laptop, you know, and for me, a guy with a laptop, it's not really music. I mean, he's playing music, but is it a live event? I mean, he hits play on a laptop, maybe scratches a record or two. It's it's not the band experience that I was used to when I was growing up. Just I, I, I guess I don't understand how that could be appealing. But then again, it's a different generation, right? The kids these days, maybe that's their thing. I just find out that in Montreal, there's a lot of that right now. There's a lot less metal. I have a friend that plays in a band and he tours and he's down in the States uh, fairly often and he goes down there and he goes down there to play because they can go down there on a bus and they can drive around and they can be in one small town one night, one small town the next night, but yet they're getting a couple hundred people come out to their show every night when they play. And around here, Montreal like that right now, the bars are so far and few between I mean, it's just, it, it's very difficult to be a gigging band in this area that wants to get out and play, let's say, a tour aspect of this area. Very hard to put it together, especially now with the way the music world is working. And, you know, there's all these illegal downloads going on. I hate to say it, but Lars was right. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it is the, it was the beginning of the end in the sense that, bands used to sign with major labels and they would get a signing bonus. They'd go in, they'd spend their time, they'd record the album. The album would go out, the band and the record company would make money on the sales. And then depending on your sales, what kind of a budget you would get with your tour support to go out there and play. And now because there is no real budget for it because people are just downloading the music for free the record companies are very reluctant to put money behind a band to get out there and play because they don't know if they're going to get it back. A lot of the bands sell most of their albums, most of their merchandise at their shows. But it's kind of a, a vicious circle because if you can't get out there to play because of lack of funding, you can't sell the merchandise and the CDs that are going to give you the funding to tour. You're stuck in this loop and it's very hard to get out of. And the record companies don't want to front anymore because they never know if they're going to get their money back. So, I mean, for my area, actually touring is quite difficult. We are hoping to take a swing at it uh, in 2017. We got a couple shows lined up before Christmas. And then the goal is to get out there and play as much as we can um, spring and summer, uh, even the, the, the remainder of the winter. And then we've uh, Steph's already been writing, so there's a good portion of our material that's ready for album two, at least from a musical standpoint. And we're actually hoping to uh, to strike with another album uh, before the end of 2017. That is definitely the game plan, and uh, try and get out there and play as much as we can. Uh, like obviously, we'd love to get into the states and play as well. Um, it's just a matter of finding a promoter, finding a way to get down there and legally play too, because you need to have permits to go across the border to play. Like if you're leaving Montreal, Canada to go to the States, you need that permit. And the same thing for American artists that want to come up to Canada and play, you need to get that permit as well. And uh, it, sometimes it can be a little tricky to get your hands on one of those, but uh, yeah, it's definitely our goal to get out there and play as much as we can. And uh, Europe is a great place too. But then again, if you don't have any tour support, that's a, uh, it's a little hard to get over there and play. That's for sure. Yeah, I recently read an article um, where um, they're making it harder for the Canadian bands to come into the United States. They're, they're making the, the work visas a little harder to obtain for some reason, which makes no sense to me. And it's not like you're bringing illegal aliens or something across the border with you, but that's what they're doing, and it's kind of hard for, on the scene. It's, the scene is bad enough as it is. They like to get some bands, like oh. different kind of bands coming down here and jam because i play a lot of canadian oh, absolutely. bands so yeah and, 
and it uh, it goes the same way for here too. They're, they the, to get the permits for the American artists to come up to the Canada to play, it's the same thing too. They're they're giving permits, but what they're doing is they're they're charging so much for these permits to come up and play that sure, if Metallica wants to come and play in Canada, they make whatever it is per show millions. They don't care; they'll pay the permit. But it's harder to get younger bands that are just starting out to play because. Again, you've got no tour support, so on top of the fact that you have to pick up the tab for your own bus, your own hotel room, hope and pray that there's people in the bar that are going to buy tickets that night so you can actually afford to eat the next day, and then on top of it all that, the government wants a cut for the permit. You know what I mean? It's like the, if in a perfect world there would be a way that you know the tickets got sold and the government got their cut off that, but no, they want their money up front and you know, right away, just in case you don't make any money, they still want their share, right? Oh, yeah. Death and taxes. <laughs> Absolutely. The only two things that are uh, certain in life, right? Yeah. All right, I'll just go ahead and play another song from your album. Um, this is The Darker Side of Me. I yes, to Darker to Side one. of Me. Yeah, this, this, song, um, this song got us in trouble. I'm actually glad you put this one on and asked me. Um, it's funny because this song is the one that's about Columbine. And somebody went online because we posted it and we put the lyrics for the song up and somebody basically tried to tell us that we were condoning school shootings. And I, I, I never go in and respond to comments on Facebook because you can just get into a war of words with a bunch of people that are usually not very smart if they want to fight about something like that online and the person was basically saying that what is wrong with us and how could we write a song about that? And if you go and read anything on our band page and what the concept of the band, it's the polar opposite. We're not condoning it. What we're saying is that these are the horrors of the world that are eating away at us as a society. And this person literally tried to tell us that we were condoning school shootings. Uh, I could even mention the name, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah there's 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 some crazies out there that's for sure oh that's for sure so this is the darker side of me coming at you right now jefferson county 911 yes i'm uh you're calling by high school just take a look at me i'm broken from the pain you've got me i'm I feel like I'm lost inside 
Hey guys, my name is Frank X, and you're listening to the Friday Night Spotlight Show. Well, we're back with Gray from Enemy. Um, so, like, what's like you guys' future goals? You guys looking to like eventually get out and tour even further than just the states or like Europe, maybe? Oh. Well, I mean, I, ideally, I, if, if somebody like basically were to tell me, okay, uh, there's a world tour waiting for you, my bag would be packed in five minutes and I'd be waiting at the bus stop. Um, yeah, definitely. We, we would go as far as we possibly could. Find. I mean, everybody in this is is in it for the long haul. And if we could go to the level where we were like, you know, touring like half the year and writing and recording the other half the year, I would sign on for that right away. And you want to know what? I don't even need to get rich from it. It's not about the money. As long as I could earn enough money that I could feed my family and like live, uh, sustain myself. I'm not in this to get rich. I mean, don't get me wrong. If I had a million dollars, it would be great, but that's not the reason I'm doing this anymore. It's, I think that a lot of people forget the fact that they started playing music for the love of music, especially when you get a lot of these bigger bands and you wonder why when bands release albums, uh, like the first one has a lot of grit and angst and anger. And, you know, they, they, they really poured themselves into it. And you can really hear the when they're angry in a song, you really hear it. And then I think that as time goes by and these bands get a little bit more cushy and they've got millions of dollars in the bank, maybe that's why after a certain time, it seems like the struggle is a little less to create that album so the end game is a little bit less as well. The product is not quite as good because, you know, anything that you really want in this life, anything that's really great, usually there's a fight for it, right? Whether it's a football game or a hockey game or whether it's releasing an album or whether it's going to school and getting a doctor's degree. It doesn't really matter what it is. Usually things that are great come with a fight. And when there's no longer any fight to achieve those goals – I think the attitude of people just gets a little bit more lackluster. They tend to slack off a little bit. They don't care as much, you know, and I'm not, I'm not speaking about everybody, but I'm just saying, I think that that's a lot of the reasons why some bands 10 albums later, the quality has gone and other bands that might not be quite as huge that still have 10 albums as well. Their 10th album is still a quality album as opposed to one that just kind of got, I don't know dipped in chocolate to sell, I guess you could say. So as for us in Enemy, um, yeah, a little bit of money would be nice so we could live, so we could get out there, we could play, uh, afford to be able to do videos and stuff like that. We are doing a video for um, the album. Within a couple of weeks, we should be doing it. Um, the original idea was to do the video for Demon Inside, which was actually um, a concept-type video to lead off the album. And bottom line, I'm not going to pull any strings. I'm not going to lie to anybody. The reason that video is not getting done, we can't afford it as a band. So we've decided to pick a different song and make it more of a just a simple band concept. It'll just be us playing. It'll look good. It'll be quality. But you won't get the story. You won't get the actors. And if we get out there, we can make enough money playing these shows and whatever. We might go back and do the conceptual video after that. It would be great. Uh but, you know, I mean, it all comes down to can we get out there? Can we play? It's in our plans to do it. But will we be able to? You know, it's a big question mark at this time. We're really pushing all we can. Uh, we start in our hometown. We're going to try and branch out from there a little bit by little bit. Obviously, like the more guys like you that are like helping us out by doing an interview like this, playing our stuff online, it's definitely going to increase our chances of getting to the States and playing. That's why us as a band, and I'm, I think I'm speaking for all these indie bands that are out there right now, it's a big thanks to you guys that are, that are playing this stuff because, you know, major radio isn't picking us up until we've got, a, you know, a disc that's 
we've got a major label's name on the back of it or, you know, or we've got a video that's playing all over the place or whatever. But without the money to back all that stuff, it's really difficult to do. So, I mean, definitely uh, two thumbs up for all you uh, radio guys out there. Uh, thanks a lot. That's what we're here for. Um, just like I don't make any money doing this, but I enjoy doing it. So, <laughs> Actually, this show can cost me money, but, you know, it's what Well, that's it. I mean... You only live once, right? If you're enjoying doing it, and that's what I say to everybody I know. Like, you know, just do what you love. Enjoy your life. You're only getting one of them. You know what I mean? Like, you can't really regret everything you do. Try and be, you know, try and do a good job along the way. Try and have a little fun, and that's that's basically where I'm at. You know, uh, the enemy for me is a fun ride. I'd really like this to continue. I'd really like to get a video done. I'd really like to get the second album done. I'd really like to get out there and play. I'd really like to not go to work on Monday morning because I'm going on tour, but it's just not a reality right now. You know? Yep. Uh, speaking of music, we'll go ahead and play one more. And um, this is choose a God. Got anything to say about this one? Yeah, this is basically about how religion screws things up big time. And I'm not pointing a finger at any one religion. I'm just saying globally. It just baffles me how everybody can think that their God is the greatest and how everybody else just doesn't seem to have a lot of value. And people have been fighting over this since the beginning of time. And unfortunately, probably will be till the end of time. So, you know, this song is basically about, yeah, hey, go ahead, choose your God, pick one. And if you really think that, you know, it's going to be your savior and that's what's going to happen, I, I really hope that uh, it works for you. Just try not to hurt anybody else that doesn't choose the same God as you do. All right. Well, this is Choose Your God, starting out to you right now. That was Choose a God from Enemy. Um, probably wrap this up a little bit here. Um, got anything special to say to your fans out there? If anybody's like knows you and you are anybody who doesn't know you, would like to say about your band and yourself personally? Um, I, I just want to say thank you to anybody that's paying attention, I guess is the best way to put it, because um, being a musician at this day and age, uh, the best thing for me to, to see is if I go onto a page and somebody posted one of our songs and you want to know what, even if somebody went and stole one of the songs online and posted it on YouTube or whatever the case may be, when you can go on there and you, you see a couple of comments and it says something along the lines of like, 
hey man, this song really means something to me, or uh, or whether it just says great tune, uh, I love to rock out to it, or whether somebody finds a little bit of a deeper meaning in something, the greatest gratification for me as a musician, as a singer, as a songwriter, the whole thing, is literally just to know that there's at least that one person out there that heard this song and it meant something to them. It it did something for them. And whether it's one person, ten, a million, I mean, obviously, the more the better. But as long as there's that one guy or one girl out there that can listen to the song and go, wow, you really did something for me. Well, it means that, you know, the day I sat there and wrote that song, it wasn't a waste of time. I wasn't the only one that liked it. Somebody else can 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 get into it and, and feel the music as well. And, and that, as a songwriter, I think is primarily the best feeling you can have i mean like and you know, as i said if you can make some money and actually get out there and play and tour and make a video that'd be great too but i think for me that that's pretty much all secondary it's it's done out of love first and whatever else comes after that it's that, that's just a bonus cool um appreciate you coming on the air with me tonight on ripper radio um we're gonna play one more as we go out this has become one and this is the Necromancer here great, with Gray. And till great next song time. to close on. Great right. song to close on. Become one. All right. Anything to it's say all going together. Real? Yeah, it's, uh, that, that's, it's literally the title says it all. It's become one. It's one of those uh, bright lights at the end of the tunnel. You know what? If we all pull together, we all become one. It'll be a better place this world. And, uh, yeah, great way to end this thing. Thanks, man. No problem. Until next time.
right, that was our spotlight with Enemy. Hope you guys enjoyed that. We'll get back to our normal scheduled program. Get back to the other music that we play here. This is... from Enemy here on live with us right here. Oh, cool. Um, This is Only Flesh with their new one for their video, Addiction Puppetry. And that's going to start at you right now.
Patriot.
This is Raven of Raven's Knock Music. Are you in a band and would like to be a part of our show on Ripper Radio's podcast? Well, send us an email at ripperradio6 at gmail.com. Be sure to include your band info, some MP3s, or any promo stuff that you'd like to send us, and we'll get you on the air at Ripper Radio or on Raven's Dog Music. So send an email to ripperradio6 at gmail.com. Hope to hear from you soon. Quote the Raven, nevermore. All right, that was Mortal Strike with Here Comes the Tank. Before that, we had Dead End Finland with Messenger of Sorrow. Demons Within with the Mark of the Unholy. Blood God with Blood God. Bay Tree with Cherry Garden. Red Cane with the Guillotine. Olathea with When I Die. And we started that block of music off with Only Flesh with their song Addiction Puppetry. Continue on with some music. This is another new one for the Ripper Radio Podcast. This is Nukem with their song War Wolf. And it's coming at you right now.
nasty shit we are dealing with If you understand it, that means you are sick But if you get a glass, it's time to dance No matter what your style, this is your new romance
Hi, I'm Kimon. And I'm Joseph. And we're from Stage, Stage War. War. And you're listening to Ripper Radio.
worried about old t-shirts and this war now. Want something that'll put the fright back in your fashion? Well, make your way over to the Ripper Gear store. Get you a new hoodie, shirt, tank top, and more. Put the fright back in your life. And your fashion. That's official Ripper Gear Official Ripper Gear Wear a shirt that's worthy of the underworld today via Ripper Gear. Horns up as always. Buy that shirt today. Ripper Radio. All right, that was Syntax with Sway for a Better Day. Before that, we had Stage War with Trapped in Life. Second, Tucson with Region 13. Somehow Joe would go with Joe. And we started out blocking music off with Nukem and their song War Wolf. And another new band to the Ripper Radio podcast. This is Fusion Bomb. With their song Power Source, and it's coming at you right now.
Ripper Master from Ripper Radio. If you're just wondering who the hell is being played on Raven's Not Music, be sure you make your way over to our website at ripperradio.weebly.com. That's ripperradio.weebly.com. There you'll find our band directory with all the bands we play at Ripper Radio and the Raven's Not Music. Also, there's an on-air section for both shows, the Ripper Radio Show and the Knock Music Show, where you can actually listen to us via the website, and you get to see the track listings of all the bands on the podcast, so you can find your, the information in the band directory, get a hold of the stuff that you like here from Ripper Radio and Raven's Knock Music. So make sure you get yourself over to the website, that's ripperradio.weebly.com. That's Ripper Radio W E E B L Y dot com. Ripper Radio. All right, that was Denominate with Degration. For that, we had Toxic Ruin with Seed of Corruption. Strict Nine with Blasphemer, Final Drive with The Confession, and we started a final block of music all with Fusion Bomb and Power Source. I can thank uh, Gray from Enemy for coming on the show this evening and talking to us about his band Enemy. Also, make sure you guys tune in again tomorrow at 8 o'clock for Raven's Knock Music. And until then, horns up, rock on. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. If you think that was scary, come back tonight. Boy, have I got something to show you. Ripper Radio.